Welcome to Moments in History, Christmas edition, where we're going to take a look at the family tree of Jesus found in Matthew and in Luke. This round of Moments in History, we're looking at genealogies. Let's recap a bit of what we learned last time. Firstly, Matthew and Luke both record the family line or genealogy of Jesus in their gospel accounts. One reason these lists are so important is because the Messiah, who was prophesied about through the Old Testament, was supposed to come from a certain place and a certain family. These lists in the gospel act as a legitimate record of Jesus, the Messiah, and where he came from. Secondly, Matthew and Luke had different people in mind when writing their gospel accounts. Matthew was writing to Jews, and Luke was writing to Gentiles, not Jews. Thirdly, Matthew includes women in his genealogy, which was unheard of back then because family lines were traced through males, not females, which was where we landed last time. This time, we land in Luke's genealogy. Luke uses the term son of over and over again, and it looks like this. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Eli, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, and so on and so forth. Today, we're going to focus in on four specific names, all which make an important statement about who Jesus Christ is. Today's four names, son of David, son of Abraham, son of Adam, son of God. Let's get started. First, the son of David. The Bible is chock full of passages that say that the Messiah would come from King David's family. 2 Samuel chapter 7 holds what we call the Davidic covenant. But Carl, what's a covenant? Great question, random person. A covenant is like an agreement or a promise that can't be broken. And if God makes a covenant with you, it's forever because God keeps his promises. In this Davidic covenant, God promises David that your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. But this isn't the only place that God talks about how David's throne will go on for all eternity. Let's look at some more. Once for all I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever, his throne as long as the sun before me. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. In fact, much of Isaiah talks about this very subject. He describes how the rule of the king of kings would not just extend to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. And for the Israelites, this was kind of shocking. Gentiles were considered unclean, and including them in the kingdom of the Messiah was something they hadn't anticipated. The prophecies don't just end with the Old Testament either. In Revelation, we see this played out. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant God made with David so long ago. Secondly, we have son of Abraham. Back in Genesis 12, God made a covenant with Abraham. We call that the Abrahamic covenant. This covenant says, I will make you a great nation, AKA, you're gonna have a lot of descendants. And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God made this promise to Abraham that through his family line, the whole world would be blessed. Remember, we just learned that Jesus would extend his kingdom to include Gentiles. Therefore, the whole world would be blessed, not just Jews. So, old man, no kids, but, Abraham trusted God, and thousands of years later, Jesus fulfilled that promise by being born into the family line of that old man. Thirdly, there's son of Adam. Adam was the first human ever. Jesus was a descendant of Adam. But Carl, that's so silly. We're all descendants of Adam. You just said he's the first human ever. Yes, I'm glad you're following. This statement makes one claim about Jesus that's vital. He was fully human. Let's look at Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest, talking about Jesus here, our high priest, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And why does it matter that Jesus was fully man? Because the atonement had to happen in the flesh. But Jesus was the only one who could make that flesh perfect by living a perfect sinless life. So Jesus is not just fully man, but he's fully sinless man. Just like the Davidic and Abrahamic covenant, Jesus was the fulfillment of another promise made back in Genesis 3. Pretty much right after Adam and Eve sinned, God showed up with his plan of salvation. In this passage, he's speaking directly to Satan. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. 
he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And that's just what happened. Thousands of years later, Jesus was born, lived a perfect sinless life, died, rose from the dead, and had victory over death and the enemy. The last son, the son of God. We've covered Jesus' humanity in this genealogy, and now we're gonna look at his deity, his godness. Jesus, while being fully man, was also fully God. There's a real fun word for this, theanthropic. Let's all say it together, theanthropic. Let's do it one more time, but with feeling, theanthropic. Colossians 2.9 says, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Carl, I have another question. Go ahead, random person. Jesus was the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, and the promise found in Genesis 3. Yeah, you're picking up what I'm putting down. Go on. What does his deity fulfill? I'm glad you asked. Isaiah 7.14 says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. And then flip over to Matthew 1. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph and said, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. One more question, Carl. Okay, uh, rude, I'm working off a script here, but go ahead. What does Emmanuel mean, and why did they call his name Jesus instead of Emmanuel? That's another great question. Emmanuel means something amazing. It means God with us. When the prophet Isaiah was saying that they would call him Emmanuel, he was talking about his nature, not his actual name. In fact, two chapters later, Isaiah goes on to describe his nature by saying, And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus is all those things and more. Yes, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the promise in Genesis 3, but he is also the fulfillment of all scripture as the Son of God. Everything in the Bible points to Jesus, our God born as a baby to live among us and to die for us. Who could have ever dreamed of such a glorious plan for our salvation?